so uh, welcome our next speaker, Equinox. Just take it away. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Ikri. Um, if you've looked at the far plans, their schedule, uh, this is unfortunately a little, little bit of a rescue effort because I had a hardware problem yesterday, so I had to recreate the entire presentation. Uh, I apologize ahead of time for this being a little bit less uh, polished than I would have liked um, it to be. Um, so let's start with a quick uh, outline of what I want to talk about here. Um, I hope you did look at the talk description. If you don't know wh where you are, then uh, maybe go figure that out. Um, the, this is mostly about how to do HF design without knowing how to do HF design. Um, it's a bit of a experience report from having it done. Um, I'm first going to give some general framing so you know what the goal is, what the target is. Um, I'm going to go talk about a little bit about why this is generally something people don't like doing, why it's hard, um, how I ended up doing it without having the proper tools for it, what the result was, um, and then there's some room for general things about uh, this thing. Um, I am a software person. Um, I don't build hardware as a job. I never learned how to build hardware. Um, I pick up things. Um, if you talk to someone who knows uh, how to do HF design, uh, raise your hand if you actually know how to do HF design with like, oh, there's someone here in the video team. Um, one more. You, you will be incredibly bored, and if you see some, uh, me uh, so, uh, saying something that is wrong, uh, feel free to correct me. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, also, if you talk to someone afterwards and they tell you, I said something that was completely wrong, that is very easily possible. Um, this got started as um, a project from the CCC NOC, um, from running event networks. Um, if you have been around for 29C3 till 33C3, uh, when we were in Hamburg, the building has a lot of shitty fiber. Um, and um, yeah, it, it wasn't great. And um, to deal with that, um, the idea uh, was to go look at maybe making some tool for, for helping with that. Um, in the particular case of the CCH, the problem is actually dispersion, which if you have multi-mode fiber, the signal has multiple modes. That's the definition of a multi-mode fiber that it can take, and those have different speeds, so the signal gets mush mushy, kind of. I don't have an installation of this, but we, we can talk about this later in the talk. There. It's coming, going to come up again. So the idea was born to make a kind of a fiber tool for building networks, for debugging networks. Um, Originally, just to extend connections in the CCH when we were range limited. Um, this kind of evolved into a more generic multi tool later. Um, if you work with network equipment and home built tools in this area, you may know that there are some PCBs that connect to um, fiber transceivers just directly to each other. Um, this was not the goal here, uh, the goal was to have an active repeater. Um, I'm noticing a few confused faces. Uh, I think I will go a little bit further in explaining what the, the goal here is. Um, I didn't include slides for this. Uh, actually, the next slide is good for this. Um, this is a, the prototype of, of this project. Uh, what you can see on the left, those two metal cages with numbers one and two, um, those are slots for optical transceivers for running network over fiber. Um, you put a module into that that matches the infrastructure that you need for your network. That might be a multi-mode transceiver, a single-mode transceiver, a single-mode transceiver with very long range, depending on what your cabling is. Um, if you have an intercontinental fiber going through the ocean, you may want to use a very long range transceiver and some amplifiers in the middle. It's, it's made into separate modules so you can adapt to the situation that you have at hand. You use the, the transceiver that you need. Um, those run at 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, 25 gigabit, soon even more. Uh, 25 is the current limit for this form factor. Um, but this talk is about 10 uh, gigabit Ethernet mostly, um, which was current at the time that this, I, I started this project. Um, 
this thing has I've built this like four years ago. It was just an attempt at, at getting something going. Um, you can see there's a small little chip uh, right immediately to the right of those two slots, um, and that is an active electrical repeater. Um, let's go back to the previous slide for a little bit. Um, you can frequently find these boards without that chip in there, which means the two transceivers that you have for converting your fiber signal uh, into the interface that your system needs, they are just connected back to back to each other. So the output from one goes into in the input from another. That, in this case, was, uh, was specifically a requirement that this is not enough. Because in a situation like in Hamburg with the building with the shitty fibers, you get a shitty signal, and just retransmitting the shitty signal is not going to help you. So I, I, I hope I collected some more people to see where, where this is going. Um, as I said, this is the first prototype. Um, it did actually work. Um, this is the current version. Um, the slide is mostly here, so you know what I'm actually talking about in the next slides. Um, the actual problem here is there's a lot of high-speed signals, four in this case, coming from four receivers. Um, and you need to deal with those. And um, dealing with, in this case, five gigahertz of an electrical signal is not a lot of fun. Um, so let's get into the actual topic of this uh, presentation. Um, it's not easy to do these designs. Um, the handbook for this, this is one of the references that people point at when you try to get started in this general area. It's, it's literally called the Handbook of Black Magic. Um, and it is appropriately called that. Um, as soon as your signals start to get a little bit faster, um, you don't actually have like rectangular waveforms anymore for your signals. Everything starts to get mushy. Um, and this is the first recommendation, basically, that I would uh, that I have buried in this talk. Um, this book is still relevant. Um, the physics doesn't really change. The chips have gotten a lot better, um, and there is basically with chips getting better, they get also get better at dealing with shitty signals. They get better at outputting clean signals. So you can just multiply everything in this book by some factor and it still applies. It's just, if this book says something about 10 megahertz, it might now apply for a higher frequency in some cases, because the, the, the silicon has just gotten better. This doesn't apply everywhere, but it applies somewhere. This book is also great to get started to understand what you don't understand. So, I, coming from a position of knowing exactly nothing about this, um, this book for me was a good point of entry to figure out, oh, this will be a problem, that will be a problem, that will be a problem. Um, let's look at actual high-frequency electronics and considerations in this area. Um, you start from your naive assumption of having an, an ideal cable, which is just a wire. Um, that works, I don't know, maybe, maybe to the megahertz range. I think even in, in the higher megahertz range you get problems with this. When, when you start getting problems, you start considering the cable as, as a sequence of Parasitic elements, they're called parasitic because they're not intended to be there. So what you see at the bottom here is just a model of what you treat the, the cable like. Um, suddenly you have capacitance, you have resistance, you have inductive elements. Um, the, the cable isn't built like this, this is just a model of understanding what the cable does. But this is only the first level. As soon as you start going into even higher frequencies, um, in this case, this is a vertical cut simulated through a printed circuit board um, with two signals. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, is the energy distribution um, of the signal being pro uh, propagated along the, 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 uh, the trace on the PCB. And you can see it's not actually uniform in the trace anymore. The trace is black. All the energy is flowing on the outside of the trace. Um, so you, you really can't consider a wire or a trace a wire anymore. It, it behaves in, in odd ways. Um, when you go to higher frequencies again, um, you should be simulating uh, your design in some software that just takes a 3D model of your entire uh, printed circuit board and um, 
divides it into very tiny elements and just calculates uh, Maxwell's equations for every th uh, single element. Um, and by doing that, you can get a better impression of what your uh, printed circuit board actually behaves like when you put a signal on it. Um, this currently, I'm not sure how far the KiCad support for this has come. Um, when I started the, the project, there was no open source implementation of this that was really usable. So I didn't really want to buy a software license for something like this, which would have cost, I don't know, a few thousand euros. Um, I didn't know people at the time who had the license, so I just didn't do this. Um, which is kind of, again, the topic of the talk. How do you do this without the proper tools? Um, and even worse, the simulation is not even going to tell you what the actual result is from making your printed circuit board. At, at these frequencies, uh, you start getting problems with having corners in your traces, where things are just getting reflected. Um, making your trace on the PCB wider or smaller can cause reflections, can cause loss. Um, having wires going through the board starts becoming a problem. So at some point, when you go high enough in the frequencies and the data rates that you want to handle, you really need to build the boards, measure them, take the feedback into account, build them again. As with before, I didn't do this. The lab gear for this is seriously expensive. Um, even renting it is very expensive. Um, I could have shipped it out to some uh, people to measure it. Um, I did, in fact, ask for that, um, and people said, yeah, I will measure it for you. I unfortunately didn't do it. Um, so the end result is what I call design by angst. Um, so all I could do was basically read as much as I could find, um, read the application notes for the chips I'm using, um, try to be as careful as possible, um, and use the tools that I have available. Um, so if I go back to this actual, uh, these, uh, what's the English word, cuts through the PCBs, um, those are for the actual PCB that I ended up building. Um, and they seem to be not too far off. Um, and um, this is a, funnily enough, this is a very buried tool from a PCB suite that has been discontinued. It's, it says at the bottom, it's called Alter PCB T Line Sim. If uh, anyone wants to play around with that, uh, you can still find the code by digging around on GitHub. You need to build it yourself. It's a very odd tool. But this was the, the limit of tools I had access to at the time. Um, this is basically what ended up being my, my result from just trying to, uh, I guess, bullshit my way through the design. Um, so you can see the, on the top there is the four ports for the transceivers that I mentioned before. I've drawn in uh, <laughs> what, what I could remember in, uh, in, uh, in well, precautions to take. Um, some of ki are kind of self-explanatory. Um, I did try to length match the differential pairs. That's uh, the circled thing on the bottom left. Um, some application notes nowadays say that you shouldn't do this, which I didn't understand. So I just kept doing it. Um, I did keep distance between the differential pairs, which is something every data sheet tells you to do. Um, there's something called the 3W rule, or even the 5W rule, which says that whatever the, the distance between your pairs is, you should have three times or five times that dif uh, distance as free area to your uh, other traces. Um, I did make this design by, uh, by keeping everything as short as I could, which then people also told me that that might not be a good idea, uh, because if you have a short uh, line, um, it's basically less uh, less attenuation for any reflections that you may, may have. So if your signal, signal starts going back and forth, which it can very much do in, at these frequencies, if it's a longer trace, it will get attenuated on the way back and then attenuated again, so your, your reflections die down. And this, is, this doesn't happen as much if you have a shorter trace. I w went with this. Um, I also used antipads, which is just punching a hole in the ground plane that is under the connector in this case, um, because the connector has much larger, uh, a much larger area on the printed circuit board where 
the connector needs to be soldered onto. Um, and that doesn't match the behavior of the other traces on your board. So what you do is you cut a hole in the ground plane, and that kind of compensates for that. Um, there are some things you can't see in uh, the diagram. Uh, you always have to have a continuous ground with all of these uh, things. And that ground plane needs to be directly below your high-speed traces, or if the high-speed traces are inside of the board, it, you need to sandwich it in, uh, in power supply planes. Um, you need to have decoupling for the chips you use. Um, using wires makes things really hard. So you can see I was able to get away without using any wires, which probably, if I had to use wires to go to some other, like to the other side of the board, then I'm guessing that this probably would not have worked. Um, so yeah, the layout in this case worked out. To be fair, most chips in this area for, for high-speed signals are designed to make the layout as easy as possible. Um, I did also invert the polarity on some of the traces here, um, reversing uh, plus and minus, basically, inside of the differential pair. Uh, the chips have a bit in the output that you can set that just reverses that, and you just need to set the bit correctly to change it back. Um, so the whole point of this talk is, did this work? If you know HF, then you can understand it's a yes. If you don't know HF, I will explain shortly w what these pictures mean. However, if you understand HF, you also mean that it didn't quite work. So I can hear a few laughs. Um, all of these are eye diagrams. Um, what an eye diagram is, is from your high-speed signal, in this case, 10 gigabit Ethernet, you take one clock period and just keep stacking it on top of itself. So looking at these diagrams, you have the signal going from a 1 to a 1 to a 1, from a 1 to a 1 to a 0 or something, or from a 0 to a 1 to a 0. And that creates these curves, basically. And the horizontal is one period of the signal. Um, and you just stack it and stack it. And five of these look good. The sixth one in the bottom is actually still OK, but much worse than the other ones. Um, the good thing in, in this case is um, that the chip I'm using um, has a built-in monitor for generating these things, because otherwise I would need the expensive test equipment again to even get this, this debugging information. So that's also something to point out as, as part of this. If you try to build high-speed electronics like this, absolutely pay attention to the debugging tools the chips give you. Um, something I saw in more expensive other chips was that they have a built-in error rate tester, which this one doesn't. So I wasn't yet able to run a bit error rate test. Um, I'm trying to find ways to, to do that. Um, but yeah, having this, this eye diagram monitor, it's a lifesaver. Now, for that middle bottom diagram, um, that, that's where you really hit the limitations of building something like this without the proper tools. I, essentially, I have no way to figure out why that one connection is worse than the others. It's probably still workable, but I, I'm not comfortable with seeing that and knowing that five of my connections are okay and the sixth one is somehow weird. Um, I was lucky in this case. Well, lucky is maybe the wrong word. Um, I did just forgot the, forget the AC coupling capacitors on that connection. Um, the HF guys may laugh at me for this. Um, for everyone else, I may need to explain what an AC coupling How many people don't know what AC coupling is? OK, that's enough. Um, so for a signal like this, um, let's go back to maybe the, this. Um, those, those two wires each are one signal. And one wire goes in the positive direction, the other goes to the negative direction. And they go around a center point, basically. And that is a DC component that just stays constant. However, your receiver may have a requirement for some specific midpoint voltage, which means that you need to put a capacitor in the middle so your receiver can shift the signal somewhere where it likes, it, uh, likes to receive it. And these chips have that requirement. And the optical transceivers have this built in except I have some connections between the chips where I completely forgot this. So I'm hoping that I can get away without debugging and um, 
just fix this. For the, for the record, I noticed this yesterday. Um, so, oops. Um, it does actually work, though, which is uh, kind of funny. Um, it hopefully is also the reason that this stuff is getting hot as shit. Uh, because if you have some difference in the DC levels between the two chips, the sender might be outputting like 1.6 volt common mode, and the receiver may, might be trying to pull down to 1.2 volt common mode, and you have just 0.4 volts being lost somewhere in the middle, and that would explain why the chips are getting so hot. I don't really have the stuff with me here to try, try and fix this here, so I'll have to go back um, and try and debug this. Um, the other Takeaway here is, at some point, you need to ask for help. Um, I did ask both RF guy and Andrew Zonberg for help, and they both, RF guy already was very helpful, gave me a lot of feedback. Um, Andrew, I asked for actually help in simulating this. Uh, I got this lost on my end and never sent him design. Um, but the point of this talk, I guess, um, is it is, in fact, possible to build things like this. Um, you need to be extremely careful about the tools you use. In this case, the chip has a lot of built-in debugging features. Um, so, yeah. Um, I kind of sprinted through my presentation. This is, uh, I expected this to take 30 minutes. It took 20 at best. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for questions. Um, I also have additional stories about building this from parts that are not directly HF stuff. Um, I had those in the presentation, and I lost it on a broken laptop. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. I have backups. They are three months old. <laughs> Oops. OK. Um, let's try maybe to get started. Does anyone have basic questions where I, I should just explain some yeah, more? Just quickly, before we get to the questions, maybe a big round of applause for Equinox. Yeah. And if you have questions, the mic row, or there will be a queue there for questions, so go to Mike over there with the mic. Yeah. So, thank you for the talk. Uh, great talk. I've done a bit of HF in the past. I would expect that uh, going uh, to 25 gigabits would be orders of magnitude uh, harder. Do you think it would be possible to do it by hand like you mostly did? Um, so, okay, for, uh, for context, um, going to 25 uh, gigabaud is not like there's some exp exponential scaling involved, which just makes things extremely harder. Uh, and I don't have the knowledge to answer your question. Um, I am, so people have asked me if it's possible to build something like this for 25 gigabit, especially because four times 25 is a 100 gigabit link. Yeah. Um, there are some chips around that I would like to use for this. The reason I haven't done it yet is and this is actually an important thing of this talk that I wanted to do. I want to give a kind of a negative shout out to one of the vendors, in this case, Macom. Um, they have the perfect chip for this, but they don't give you access to the data sheet. You can find it like by Googling, but it's only a basic sheet. The chip is perfect for building some, like, something like this, but they are extremely dismissive if you try to contact them and try to get more information. I may have another talk in two years, three years about what the story was with 25 gig, if it worked out. Um, I would, so since at this point, KiCad is getting the support for, I'm losing the microphone, sorry. So since KiCad is getting the support for simulating the boards, I would hope that this is sufficient to stretch the, the possible some more, basically. Sorry. Um, I honestly don't know. I am, I'm the person who's uh, telling how far I was able to get without knowing how it works. <laughs> um, we, we may need to find, uh, there were some people who raised their hands about being HF engineers. If someone else wants to uh, 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 throw in their two cents, uh, I, I'm happy to hear. Uh, so. And the next question. Hey, uh, great talk, and, and, and you're a hero for attending this. Um, 
you had this really cool thing about um, the monitor of the chip being used to give you the eye um, diagram. Uh, did, did you try to maybe do your own test equipment so that, you know, to hack the chip and just measure other devices' eye diagrams? Um, so, okay. Um, the, the chip has a built-in eye monitor. However, the chip only works for certain ranges of, of, of signal. It's a lot that it works for. So the chip has a range of either 8 to 10 point something or 9 to 12 point something gigabaud. And it can divide that by 1, 2, 4, or 8. So it works in kind of some areas. You could connect that to get a rudimentary eye monitor. Um, I haven't thought about making my own test tool. Um, I was hoping that maybe someone will, would build an open source VNA, which is the right tool for this. Um, it might also be possible to use, um, uh, if you know the nano VNA, um, that's single-ended, but if you combine it with a balloon, it might be possible to do differential measurements. Again, so I don't feel comfortable building a test tool myself with the limited understanding I have. I feel like I can build an application, but I can't build an actual measurement device because if you build a measurement device, you should know what you're doing, you know? That's my... <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, sure. So for a, a, a proper test equipment, yeah, sure. But uh, just for hacking around, um, mm -hmm. if you just have some sort of breakout board to do this, I, I wasn't even aware that these chips can do that. Mm. So this um, is really cool. You, you can take a copper direct attach cable and just cut it open. Um, that should work if you have the right signal levels. However, the signal levels are mostly the same anyway for all of this high-speed stuff. So that shouldn't be a problem, I would hope. Um, yeah, and then we have the next man. So you said your motivation was like the uh, faulty cables in the CCH, but the CCH tear down and now rebuild. I mean, they, do you see any other cool stuff you can do? I they mean, still have the same shitty fibers, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, cool. Um, so if we go back to Hamburg, um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure they have the exact same type. I do know that they still have multi-mode fiber. And, oh. I did mention that I wanted to go into a little bit more detail why multimode fiber is a problem. So, normally when, you, when the signal gets weaker, um, you, on the optical signal, this is the electrical signal to be clear, on the optical signal you just get a closer and closer eye and at some point the receiver doesn't work anymore. With the shitty multimode fiber you get horizontal eye closure because the signals take different paths and they get mushier and mushier on the time domain. So the horizontal is the time on this. Um, I'm not sure if the CCH still has multimode fiber that is as bad as it was before. I only know that they put back multimode fiber in general. I would hope that they did maybe replace it. Um, but yeah, so if we go back to Hamburg, which seems likely, um, we may want to use those again. I don't know, maybe. Um, apart from that, um, it is intended as a general fiber tool. Um, it does have uh, batteries. It's pocket-sized. Uh, you can just put um, transceivers into it and use it as a helper while you roll out your network. Uh, we did have multiple occurrences at build-up during camp where this would have been useful. Unfortunately, this is not quite ready. The hardware works. I've connected my laptop to the internet through this at 10 gig. So I know it works, except the software still needs to be done. <laughs> so um, I can, right now I need to like do I2C register writes to set it up correctly. And it's, it wasn't quite ready because I ran out of time in, in, in the run-up to the camp. Uh, so, yeah. I think it's useful as a tool. Sorry, next question. Yeah, hi. Thanks for your talk and your nice project. Uh, following up on the 25 gig, you are lucky. You, you go to optical transceivers, to SME converters. Your traces are all short. It's completely different when you do a layout that actually goes then to 100 meter copper. So this, this helps in your case. Uh, and you did your proper job in analyzing and being very careful reading all the stuff you do the same for 25 gig probably you have to switch away from fr4 space material to yeah. get more half rf ready 
but it's it's doable. You can still do it with with SkyCat and Analyze with with uh, other FEM tools, which yep. are open source around. It's just more work, and you need to select properly your PCB vendor and all the impedance control, which just costs more money. So possibly this is. Uh, going to the more debug features, as you said, your chip has a built-in uh, eye monitor, but for very limited frequencies, and you don't have the bit error rate tester. Uh, if you are interested in doing debugging with these kind of features, go for FPGA development boards, which mm. have SFP yeah. modules, and you then you don't have open source tools, then you just install the, open, uh, the tool chain from the vendor, and there you have I eye belt or uh, smart belt yeah. features inside the transceivers of the FPGAs. Buy a development kit with, with a proper layout and done and mm. connect it to here. And then you can still do loopback tests and, yeah. and get yeah. all your features done. I, I think this is a, a really long question, but <laughs> <laughs> the finally the question, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, there are some FPGAs where I think you can in fact also get an eye diagram. From from the debug software, like yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know, like I know these features exist. Um, so if if other people want to know more about this, I guess they can come to you. <laughs> um, and yeah, the the vendors certainly know how to make their boards for their dev kits because they want to sell their hardware. Uh, next question. And maybe just one very short question. <clears throat> did you try about uh, talking about the VNA stuff? Uh, did you try this in uh, VNA front end uh, IC from analog ADL five nine six zero? I'm. I have become aware that it exists. I haven't looked at any of the details yet. Um, I, it's the same comment as before. Um, I'm not sure I have enough knowledge to, to look at measuring equipment because that, that analog devices ship is really targeted at building a VNA. Um, and I, I feel like I don't have enough knowledge to do that. I would hope that in general someone will build an open source tool like that. Maybe the nano VNA people will just make, a, I think, version 6 is the next one. Um, but that would ver be very cool. Um, oh. I did forget a comment to the previous. <laughs> um, this is also manufactured by GLC PCB, which is cheap Chinese PCBs. So that's another comment on, on like the feasibility of this. With 10 gig, you can get away with using cheap, mostly specified PCBs. Uh, the funny thing is that GLC PCB changed their specification of their layer stack ups midway through me building this which is not ni nice either, um, but this is certainly not precision PCBs. This is just a cheap four-layer board, um, which also four-layer boards are just cheap enough these days. Don't even try to do this with a two-layer board. It's not going to work, I'm pretty sure. Next question. Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, just that this is probably the last question. And then if people want to find you after this to talk to you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me in the knock. I do have 10 more minutes, right? Yeah, you have 10 more minutes. I think we can just fill with questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there seems to be one in queue, so. Yeah, I just have a short comment about something you just said. Uh, you said that the FPGA vendors know how to build their dev boards because they want to sell them. Don't count on it. It's <laughs> <bad>. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, sure. Well, switch vendors don't know how to build switches either, I can tell you from experience. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, considering that I have 10 minutes left, I can just go into random other stuff. Uh, because, uh, oh, sorry. There's one more. Yeah, so you asked for comments from other people who <coughs> had experience doing this sort of thing. Uh, I did a HDMI matrix switch, ah. and then a DisplayPort matrix switch and uh, had very similar experiences to yours, except mostly things just work. Yeah, it's... And I think it's to do with receiver quality. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you have some, some measurement that you could do to get the, like some eye diagram or just some measure of whether you were barely working or working well? Uh, so I, I did actually do oscilloscope measurements at low frequencies. Okay. Ah. which told me something. And then I sent the board to Andrew, which told me a lot more. Um, there is actually an HDMI retimer chip 
which can ah. which can do eye measure um, eye diagrams. Okay, but it's out of stock. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> well, once it's back in stock, I'm I'm also planning to to make a measurement tool like this. Yeah, this this thing got delayed by two years as well because not like the microcontroller was just not available and other chips were just not available and yeah, luckily that has mostly come to an end. Um, yeah, if people are still interested, there's an, there's actually two boards in this, and as it turns out, uh, most of the problems in building this actually came from the power supply and building a overcomplicated environment ag around all of the HF stuff. Um, I tried to build this as power savvy as possible, which caused more problems. It has battery charging, with that, which has caused problems. So I think the closing sentence here is um, maybe try one thing first. Um, the HF stuff can definitely be done. Um, and don't forget the other stuff. Um, if, if I had been a bit more careful, I think I could have saved myself quite a few revisions. I think this is revision five or six of this board as far as manufacturing goes. I do have prototypes with me if people want to go look at the actual PCB. Um, you can find me in the NOC, uh, which is over there near the uh, fence to the camping area. It's a white tent. Uh, please be uh, polite slash restrained when entering the tent. It's possible that people are working to debug the network. So if there's like a rush of activity, then maybe come back a little bit later. Um, I haven't actually pushed this out on GitHub yet. I plan to do that. Um, you can find me on Mastodon, uh, equinox at chaos.social. Um, my GitHub is linked from Mastodon. And I think that's yeah, cool. Thanks for attending. Big round of applause.